Okay, I'm gonna start now. <laughs> all right, um, thank you all for coming. Um, okay, so welcome everyone to the Hardy Gallery's Juror Talk with artist Barry Carlson. Barry is a printmaker and painter, who resides in Madison, Wisconsin, originally from Nebraska. Barry received his MFA in printmaking from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He teaches at UW-Madison and Madison College and is a full-time artist most known for his landscape paintings that can be seen at Edgewood Orchard Galleries in Fish Creek, Wisconsin. Barry's exhibition record spans four decades, having received numerous awards and recognition for his work and is in several public and private collections. He has been active in curating select printmaking shows, including one of his most recent curatorial projects, the Vox Populi Print Collective, a member-based collective that exhibits both internationally and nationally. Barry has also participated in group printmaking shows, including the Hardy's 2015 exhibition, The Exquisite Corpse, which was arranged by UW Green Bay printmaking professor, Christine Style. His extensive background in the visual arts is why I asked him to jury this show. His experience in both the commercial and museum art world are a valuable resource that I felt would benefit the artists who submit their work into our annual juried exhibit. With that said, I wish to thank uh, Barry for joining us today and thank you for jurying our show. You're welcome, Sarah. <laughs> okay, so the format of this talk will be a discussion with Barry about his process for jurying the show followed by a presentation of his work and then any questions from our live listeners. Feel free to type your questions out if you're listening on YouTube or Zoom today. All right, now bear with me. I have to do a million things right now. I'm wearing the same shirt as in the photo so you recognize me. There you go. Good thinking. All right. So um, let me get myself organized and then we can get into it. All right. So this was, um, well, do you have anything to say, Barry? Let's before I. Well, I just thought as an overview, maybe talking about um, having been invited to be a juror was a, a great honor, I thought, and uh, my pleasure. I always get excited when I'm in invited to do these things because it's sort of like uh, you know opening boxes at Christmas you really don't know what you're going to get and so coming up to the show I never come into a situation like this with a predetermined game plan I guess and I want to take a look through the show and get a, a feel for the the nature of the artist there and the kind of um, I guess the sort of rhythms of the show and and uh the level in which work it resides at. And uh, this was a very diverse show in a lot of ways. So there was a, a good deal of um, stratas of artwork and a pretty wide representation of mediums and approaches. Uh, you know, it was something that I, I try to, when I made judgments about the awards I uh, put forth were to sort of distribute amongst as best I could best representations of given um, mediums where I was able to do that and also not try to let my predilection toward maybe some of the things that people know me for as landscapes be a determining factor. So I wanted to look at work from the genres as well as the media that they exist in and try to find what I thought were best examples of uh, within them and then measuring between, you know, the representative samples from a given genre, I would say, you know, we have an awful lot of strong X types of work. Uh, I have to decide within that if those all merited um, status above maybe some of the other uh, forms of artwork. So I, I think I felt very good about the first three choices that I made, first four, and then when I got to the honorable mention stage, I felt like there was probably, you know, a dozen other works I might have chosen. And if I had the ability to give more, I probably would have done so. But um, since we're on Trina's piece right here, I, I think starting off with that, to me, that was the, the best show or best work in the show for a number of reasons. 
and it probably had as much to do with the the uh, feel of the work, you know, the kind of joyous buoyancy, no pun intended, with, with the ball uh, that the work has um, in the time that we exist right now and the kind of opening up of society. And there's a joyousness about that, um, kind of a looking back, a certain nostalgia to the work too, that I think with the fashion of the, the bather and the uh, kind of feel for a, a time that we all kind of missed and now are re associating with. Uh, I think the design of the work is outstanding. It has a graphic quality that makes, you know, a very simple statement, um, uh, uplifting and designed from the standpoint of the visual elements extremely well. And it's painted extremely well too. So I, I think that the artist has a, a good handle on the medium, uh, a, a great sense of design, and just the spirit that made me feel like you know it was the, it was the right choice for number one yeah okay this was um word second place yeah and i felt this this was a piece that i could easily have walked past for you know me being a two-dimensional artist, I tend to look at the wall first, and then I have to kind of remind myself that I'm walking around objects in the room that I should see as more than obstacles. They're, they're uh, you know, various pieces of artwork that are three-dimensional there. But this one shined for me because one of the things I like, um, feel like some, some bits of coming from an academic setting uh, are discounted today is uh, oftentimes in many circles kind of a decrafting or a de uh, this, this aesthetic quality and something that this piece exhibited was the opposite of that it has a very high degree of finish and craft um, it's exquisitely created and uh, the design of the piece is very unusual so it's kind of a like a little close-up landscape of a stream with some lily patties lily pads and some other natural elements like that but done you know in beadwork and uh, not knowing a lot about the medium uh, I just felt like this this just exhibited a sense of joy that I could look at and and investigate and, and move in space and turn around even the backside where the the, the clasps are where were designed in a really beautiful way. Um, I would just say, if I had to say a tiny criticism, and it's not something that uh, detracts from the artwork itself if you isolate your eyes to the artwork, but here's a case where um, there's a lot of dis kind of distracting elements in the photography. So, you know, when an artist does take a picture of their work, it's like if you see a a pimple in the middle of someone's forehead that's the thing you look at so you don't you don't want to have anything inside the photo beside the artwork that would distract from the work itself so for me if i was going to suggest anything here and i don't want to start getting into a critique about everybody's methods but it's such a beautifully done piece put it into a setting that has a very neutral uh background that maybe like one of those scrims that fits underneath the artwork that is a seamless background that a commercial person would use to photograph a product or something. And that's really the only thing I could say in the gallery, you know, that's not an issue, but seeing this for the first time now, I wish that the person had taken a little better picture. Um, but it's, it doesn't say anything, you know, if I saw this on somebody's, um, you know, wearing somebody wearing this or just being set in a gallery setting, it's, it's really exquisite. So that, that to me was a good, choice for second place yeah i i would be a photographer myself yeah or just you know something white map board is fine too if you need like a really makeshift studio yeah it's lit well though at least yeah it's lit well. uh, so this one um was a photograph i kept coming back to again and again and uh i, I think we're we all can be very seduced by this kind of majestic landscape it's like something from the Midwest that we're not so familiar with. So it has an exotic, exotic quality to it. Uh, but the closer you looked at the photo, the more amazing it became because it's just, and I'm not a photographer, but there was like no point in which anything was like anything out of focus or it had just an, 
a really like a jewel like quality and almost like a hallucination in a lot of ways. I think this representation is a little bit under colored from the original. Uh, so the photographer, um, you know, the work, if you see it in person, is even more vibrant than this. I know it looks different on everybody's screen probably, but it was just, I thought, a, just a, a photograph that I would I could live with and, and enjoy over time. Uh, I like the design. It's a simple kind of bifurcated composition, a little bit off center. So it's not absolutely symmetrical, but there's this light side, dark side kind of yin yang look to it. Uh, the sky is counterpoints to the, the rock forms, very beautiful. Um, you got color in complements, working with oranges and violety blues um, and purples and things. So, you know, it was just, it's hard not to love something like this, plus the fact that, I mean, I'm, I don't fly drones or anything. I assume that this is probably shot through a drone uh, uh, photo, but you know, it's just, it's quite an accomplishment to, you know, go to that place in nature and, and get this photograph at that particular time of the day. Uh, everything was just right about it. So. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, and Patrick's piece it appealed to me a great deal. It has a sincerity to it. Um, it has, that kind of an earnest quality that I think a lot of people, you know, if you go to a little too long to art school, you you tend to be self-conscious about some things um, being too, unless they're done with irony or somehow uh, arresting in quality. This is this is looks like a sincere kind of a um, remembrance of maybe a time with the father or uh, maybe a father with the son. I don't know whose perspective we're taking here, but or looking back at a time when you were younger, possibly. So I, I think that, that that was very uh, true for me. But beside that, it, it has a stylistic quality, um, both from the compositional standpoint, you know, there's a great big figure, which is, I guess, the present, maybe remembering the past or thinking about the other individual in the, in the photo or the painting, drawing. Um, egg tempera. But, yeah, egg, okay, egg tempera. Um, but it has a, a kind of a mark making quality that's very, um, in a certain sense, printmakerly, but it's like the overlay and visual uh, optical mixing of colors to create the, the effect that it's gotten through these little cross hatches. Sort of like when you look at a, a pointillist painting or an impressionist painting, you get these strong blending of colors where you come up close to it, you start to see the objects and surface kind of dissolve into marks and back away and you begin to see the, the mixing like you could see quite clearly in the hand, for instance, you know, to get those flesh tones and things or the um, bibs. There's a lot of colors beside just the green in there. So that's a very masterful way of approaching um, and, and a, a unique ma mark making quality that makes it stand out. So yeah, I, I just want to add like in the framing is just really, really captivating. That's I always that's, stare at this picture in the gallery. Yeah, that, that's true. There is a, a border around a portion of it that was colored, I think, like a little red line that kind of cropped out by the artist. Um, sometimes presentation, you know, speaking maybe to the, the second piece with the, the uh, necklace, um, if it's in the gallery, found a good piece of work presented in a great way makes it a better piece of work. A great piece of work presented in a bad way makes it a lesser piece of work. So, you know, it's the it's again, it's it's like either you could say you're, you know, too much is gilding the lily, but not enough. It's always the the worst point or the 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 last thing you throw in that that's like a second thought or the or the least considered that can ruin a piece. So, uh, this was presented very well too. Yeah. Yeah, and this is um, one of the three uh, honorable mentions. And I really like this for its luminous sense of light. And uh, it's a simple watercolor. It was also framed meticulously, very, very nicely done. Uh, watercolor is a medium that I used to work in a long time back. And it's so unforgiving 
that you know when you do have something you're basically painting with air almost and the the lighter patches here they're just off white uh, it's such a tiny amount of water or pigment in the water and uh, the ability to maintain kind of a, a fluid quality along with the uh, quality of line and shape to hold those all all together it, it's it's not you can't make mistakes you ha can't cover up your errors and I thought that the design of this is very simple um, you know it's a kind of a prosaic um, still life of some fruit in a bowl but you know you have the transparency of the bowl and little bits of the glass coloration in the shadow there um, and the reflections on the tablecloth and then there's that patterning of that uh, flower form on the tablecloth along with that really strong Baroque diagonal uh, coming splitting the circle in half uh, and then also using the edge of the canvas or paper in this case uh, to crop off that pair is a nice kind of a balancing between the symmetry of uh, that center arrangement and then that pair off to the right um, and then the cascading of kind of like opposite you get the the sinister is the baroque diagonal and the sinister diagonal are the two diagonals that people used in the in uh, creating these dynamic compositions in the renaissance and past that um, so it, there's a real strong sense of design in this piece which i liked a lot um these aren't in order of what you placed them in but this was your third honorable mention but i bumped it to two because I think just stylistically just fit that. Okay, go on. Yeah. You know, and I think here, here's a case where I spent a lot of time. This was my last selection. It doesn't make it the third place of the honorable mentions, but it was right. the last one I looked at. And I was having a very difficult time with trying to get a feel for some of the non-objective work, the abstract work that uh, was found in kind of a nice arrangement on the wall. And many of those pieces I was just just wrestling with, which is the most interesting to me. And um, it was particularly a, another piece and this one that I kept going back and forth on. But what made me decide this was the piece, and it's a very modest sized piece. It's very maybe uh, you know 15 inches by 12 or 16 by 12 or something like that. It's very small. I like the material quality of it. It's, it's a, really a sculptural painting. Uh, you, you might not see it from this perspective and, and understand that, but there's a scrim that's like a window screen that has uh, paint or silk screening applied to it to create those white forms in a couple of layers so that there's, there's kind of a ghostly atmospheric interaction of those things. And then there's a layer or two of kind of a canvas material that's wrapped around after I look closely. the it's a stretcher frame that's been painted. So you're looking at the backside of what would conventional painting would be painted on, the material support for that. And then these canvas elements are wrapped around it and then given a little bit of a volumetric kind of handling by the, the change of uh, tone in the given color fields. So it, it just has, it has a lot for me that, to come back to and look at and kind of ponder on and think about how the artist presented it um, in this black shadow box frame that was very nicely done. So yeah, it's, it. it's different, it's weird, it's different. Yeah, it is, and for that reason, I think it stood out for me. Um, you know, there was, there was unfortunately, I didn't see any, uh, I, there was a few prints in the show that I, I would like to have included, but you know, I just felt that these three were probably of those that I had the chance to look at and think about on the day that I was there, the ones that I went for. So, okay. yeah. Yep. And the last one was. Oh yes, that's right. So this one, I thought, um, you know, I needed a feel for the three-dimensional um, sculptural work too. I mean, it it seemed like this one was one that I spent a lot of time looking at. It was. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle that's been put together, but made out of found objects, which are all driftwood, and then painted in a way that uh, brings everything together. Um, in this real kind of a whimsical tongue-in-cheek way but it's obviously you know there's a strong kind of a philosophical or political uh, point of view here uh, with the snakes and everything but it has it has still a playfulness that I, I think is quite appealing 
and it's also handled the materials handled very well so there's there's paint applied to this but it's done in a way that integrates really well into the material that it was derived from um, this is one that i think could have benefited from a little better photography too yeah this is not it looks really amazing in the gallery yeah so maybe if I was to have shot this, um, I don't know, I might have chosen a slightly lower perspective, but I would have definitely tried that seamless background again, because there's just a lot of a lot of weird stuff happening, like a tape in the background and a fold and this and that. Also, um, it looks really narrow and it's really wide. It's like yeah. I, I think that's again, because somebody shot from a high perspective and there's a little bit of lens distortion. It, it's more pyramidal right yeah mm -hmm. yeah and yeah that head of that major snake is nowhere close to that size in reality i mean it's sort of like they it's just like it got gigantic but anyway it's yeah, yeah. A pretty cool piece yeah um, it's it's worth seeing in the gallery it it um i actually was kind of surprised you gave it an honorable mention but it made it made sense but then again i'm always kind of um surprised by what you guys pick yeah i'm no. Like I say, maybe a different day, it would have come up in a different state of mind. I might have chosen a couple of other ones. So I don't think I would have deviated from the, the first four that I chose, but there was a lot of work at this level um, and above of quality. And it was just really hard to do those three for me. Yeah, I think, you know, what you did was you picked an award for each medium. I and, tried. It, you know, it's fair, you know, um, but yeah, so yeah you're right i think a lot of the show is pretty much at the same level and so it's really hard to pick an award you know seven different awards for that um you know for, from that show so yeah. but you know we had 143 submissions and you know that's kind of a lot of work to pick from so yes it was a very it was a very well hung show and and landscape heavy, I should mention. Yes, landscape heavy. Um, there was a lot of well, not a lot. There was several professional artists that I know of or know personally in 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 the show, and I I didn't exclude those because I felt like oh, you guys have other venues and other chances. I I just thought that these I don't know the backgrounds of any of these artists really, but I I thought that they just had um, for what I felt like was. I, you know, really exceptional results from what they tried to accomplish. So, yeah, it was, it, it's a well-designed show. If, um, I don't know if everyone online now has actually seen it in person, but it's it's very well-designed in, in the way that it's hung in the space. Um, it's, it's, you know, that can have as much to do with people's opinions of shows too, is the combinations of their uh, neighbors and um, arrangements uh, for scale and and uh, genre and, and subject matter too. So I thought you did a great job, Sarah, with putting it on the wall. Thanks. One thing I do, I want to just go back to this piece because we've met, I've talked to you about it before. Yeah. About the post editing that goes into photography, and I think Dan Anderson is just a genius when it comes comes to it. You know. Um, you know, he's so good at, you know, sharpening and color rendition and, you know, proofing. And, you know, I think you can't tell on the screen, but, you know, it's one thing to shoot the image and then have it on your computer. It's another to output it. And that's one thing that we, you know, we learned a lot in, in, in photography when you go to school for it is outputting is so important. And I'm pretty amazed at how sharp this is for being a drone. It's image great. but yeah. so much science and in, in, um in photography comes stems from like nasa you know because they need these cameras for space so then it trickles down into the consumer level so um but no i just wanted to mention that with dan anderson's work is that he's just really wonderful at post edit and you know making these things really you know sharp and pop you know uh as a print, you know, and that's that's the genius, that's the masterful work in photography. Is the fun part is shooting, and then post editing is really the boring, horrible part of it, you know. It'd be like having a story in your head and not being able to spell or something, you know, or write. Right, it. Well, right. You know, a lot of people can't write either, or they, you know, they're. Um, e. 
or the hate writing, you know, but, um, but you have to write in, in order to become a better writer. I think, you know, people get that knocked out of them when they're going to school too. Yeah. And you know how art is. Everyone yeah. thinks they have to write these philosophical discussions about their work because that's what the contemporary art world is showing. And, um, you know, half the time it's like, what? So anyway. Yeah, yeah a lot of it's baffle gab, we used to call it. Just a, a way to use big words to obfuscate something um, that could be said simpler and probably doesn't need that much thought. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. You could always, the, the people that come right out of grad school always have a certain set of uh, vocabulary that you'll hear. And, too much art theory, way too much. Anyway. And, it, it dissolves away pretty quickly when you get out of school and you're not dealing with people that live and breathe that rarefied air, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. So is there any other follow up from this show that you want to talk about? Um, no, I just was it was thrilling to be able to do it. Um, it's a you know, beautiful day in Door County and I got to look at a lot of nice work and um, I felt like it was it was great to be invited, as I said. So, yeah. You know, it was great to work with you and great to have you here. And, you know, this is such a weird but interesting show because it's just in-person submissions, you know, so, um, but I think, you know, you benefit as a judge and as an artist to have your work juried in person because, yes. you know, if you were to jury, like, you know, like you said, this piece looks a lot more stunning in person than it does in this photo. Sure. And, you know, probably the artist didn't have time to photograph it because when you're, um, when you're um, not a photographer, you don't really mm -hmm. know how to do that stuff really well, or you know, you really have to learn how to do that. And um, it's not the one thing you're, you know, valuing in the process. Sure. But it is so important. And there's like a gazillion tutorials on YouTube of how to, you know, photograph your stuff. And, and but then it's Photoshop too, because what you could actually do in a photo like this is actually just cut around it. Mm -hmm and then mask it with a white background. And then you have like a complete image of that, so. Um. So I guess to respond to that, just thinking forward toward, you know, maybe every everyone thinking of themselves as an artist doing work, they're spending a lot of time, money and, and heart to, to create the objects that they do, uh, create and take that extra 5% of your time to make the result at the end represent the work to the best degree it can. So, you know, go to YouTube or find some tutorials elsewhere. If you're not certain, get a good set of lights, find the right space to um, photograph your work, get a gray card, know, learn how to color balance. If it's not in Photoshop, find some other uh, photo software that you could, you shoot the gray card, you balance the neutral gray to that, and then all your colors are perfect. You know, you get your light set so that it's not going to create hot spots and glare. And um, then people could look at your work in its truest light. So it, it's, you know, when people go through this effort over years and they still make that same mistake or they have some excuse about it, then I don't have a lot of patience for that because, you know, it isn't like you're learning a new language or it's not like um, rocket science it's really a small thing that little things can make great differences if you pay attention to that end product. It's gonna get you further and, and into more shows. If you're entering shows and not getting in, two things, well, there's three things that probably happen is like, you're just on, out of favor with the person who curated or juried the show. Can't help that, that's just the way it goes, it's taste. My tastes, if somebody else came in and juried the show, probably every, uh, award might have been different. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't, but it probably would have. But, um, you know, the work might need a little polishing up or it might need some, you know, improvement. But even if it was great and the juror was just the kind of simpatico juror you'd want and you photographed it in a lousy way, you're probably going to be at a disadvantage. So that's one thing that's the easiest to fix. And it's one thing that's in your control. Great. Great. Those are all great recommendations. Um, one thing in case, one really simple way of doing this, if you don't want to have the lighting or don't have, can't afford it, overcast day, if you don't have glare on your, on your glass for art, 
it can also work really well too. Like if you and in order to get rid of glare, you got to double polarize your lights and your um, lens. So um, there's there's a store in Milwaukee called American Science and Surplus, and they make these giant sheets. They have these giant she sheets of polarizer film that you can put over your lights. It's perfect. Um, but anyway. All right, so did, um, moving on, um, we were going to talk about your work. Okay. So did you want to start that presentation? Yeah, I certainly can. Okay, let me, um, let me see if I could share my screen. Figure out. I have so much coordinating. Okay. Yeah. Um, it says this, uh, I, I just clicked on share my screen and it says this will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. If it blows up, then we'll restart that. Okay. I think this is going to work. Yep. Oh, look at that. All 100 right. images, 35 years, and a few good decisions. Wow. Yeah. We have that much time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'll go right. through a lot of these pretty quickly. Um, I think I'll just say um, I'm framing it not as a complete retrospective. I don't have images back to 35 years ago, but I'm starting with the idea that, you know, I've been at this for a while and it's something that um, didn't happen overnight. And sometimes I look back and I, I feel like I ended up in a place I didn't intend to be. That is, I'm still in Madison, Wisconsin after coming here for grad school. And I became a graphic designer for 30 years, whereas I vowed I'd never do that when I got out of undergrad. Um, I did teach over the course of time, you know, since 1990, I've taught at the UW on a periodic basis. And then in about 2015, I taught for three years when my former uh, professor retired. Um, and I simultaneously began teaching at Madison College. I ended my design career um, in 19 or 2015. Um, and that, that was a career that was probably majority part-time it started off part-time, became full-time, and I got some arts board grants from the state when they still had such things, and began to realize I could cut back my hours a little bit um, because I was having some success showing my work. And I had a, a cooperative employer. I was a designer at the UW uh, working in the publications office. Um, and they allowed me to pack my hours eventually into a three-day week where I would um, work for 10 or 12 hours a day, depending on the day. It was 10, 10, 10, or 9, 9, 12. And then I would spend the other two days in my studio and worked at night when my kids were small and just slept a little less. So about um, 20, say, 05, I think, yeah, 20, 20, yeah, 05, I decided to improve my studio, which was a studio that um, was in a two-car garage for 20 years. I painted in this garage. It was heated, and I did a, a non-code uh, pipeline out there and put a furnace in with natural gas. I'm really shocked it didn't explode or burn me up because I, after digging it all up, I was like, wow, I did not know what I was doing. And I, I spliced this gas line together out of about 10 different materials. And I said to a friend in the trades, I'd like to make the studio bigger. And he says, there's so many structural problems with this. You just should tear it down and start again. And I was like, no. But then I thought, well, maybe he's right. So I uh, cashed in a life insurance policy, uh, got my visa card out, took some savings uh, from paintings that I sold and stuff and started this process. And I decided to build it myself. So in the summer, in the spring of that year, I had uh, hired this guy with this big backhoe. And within an hour, the thing was taken down. So it was really impressive how quickly and I was so happy that I hired that guy to take it down for about $1,000. So then I had that same person uh, pour footings and foundation. And I decided that if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go whole hog. I'm going to have it plumbed. It's, it's a heated. It's basically a house behind my house. So I trench to the house, um, built the thing myself with the help of my son for one summer. And uh, by the September of that year, I was making paintings in it. 
So it has several different sections to it. It's 24 by 36 with the second story. Those are skylights that are in a clearer story area for my painting area. And then upstairs, I have kind of an office. So this is what it looks like. And it has these opening doors that I can open when the, when the weather's nice and have screens on them. I have air conditioning, I'm sitting in the air conditioning right now. This is a, a number of years ago, but here's my painting area. And uh, I, I have ventilation, those tubes that are running look like dryer vents are for evac uh, to take uh, you know, fumes and stuff out. I have a painting table that rolls around and several other tables on the right hand side that are, that are just uh, movable tables with flat files and stuff in them when I need to move them. That's a woodworking area in the back and then a stairway up to my second story. The bottom left, you can see a bicycle helmet. That's a printing press, it's a lithography press. And that thing that looks like a, a flat, well, it's a stone on a cart, is a lithographic limestone that I could talk about if anybody cared to hear about the process. But that's what I was trained as in grad school. I specialized in lithography. So it's a printmaking form. And I'll show you some examples of that. This press is well over 100 years old. Um, and then there's another smaller stone you could see on the right hand side, and along with inks and rollers. So that's my printmaking area. Upstairs is uh, where I'm sitting right now is a kind of an office space and my computer is there. I have a, uh, an exposure unit from a commercial printer that I could use to burn uh, photographic plates for my printmaking processes. Uh, so that's pretty much everything I always wanted. And by 2017, I was doing you know a lot more work in the space, but still had my job. Um, this is, I'm starting here. This is maybe, I'm not sure the dates of some of these paintings. They're, they're all from the last 10 years. Uh, this is some of the paintings that I was pretty much known for in Door County and elsewhere. Um, I'll just go through. What's with the frames? You know, your, your frames yeah. are important to your piece. They are. I, I felt um, frames for me, um, I like to integrate them into the painting in some fashion. So they're not a, an afterthought. They're something that is, is designed into the painting itself. And they vary and you'll see many different examples of how that works. My dad was a bricklayer and I, I always felt like it was a touchstone to craft. So I designed, you know, I work in wood, of course, frames generally are, uh, I couldn't make brick frames, but it was a way for me to kind of keep, um, I don't know, some some sort of a nod to the to his sense of craft and and uh, I like having some of the motifs of the frames kind of refer back to various points in history, maybe tramp art, for instance, you see some of the German immigrants that came to Wisconsin that would travel around and, and some of the frames that they were made back in the 1920s and earlier have certain qualities that you'll see in a few of them. And then I've also done some carving and shaped frames and this one. Um, they, a lot of them are derived from kind of distillations of uh, some medieval and Renaissance uh, frames for European um, religious paintings too. Uh, here's a, a triptych, um, kind of the use of some influence of some daguerreotypes and some of the uh, early photo processes. This is all painted, but I like the, the kind of distressed monochromatic quality of those those two side paintings and then counterpoint to that, the, the kind of realistic uh, painting in the center with the, the boat. This has some carving you could see on the frame. Um, I, I like the north. It, it's probably a bit of nostalgia or remembrance for me. Um, going up uh, to Canada and my grandfather had a cabin in northern Minnesota and then I fished a great deal uh, for many years up north with in vacation with my family and, and fish with my friends. But it's sort of me kind of touching on my family experiences and sort of uh, interjecting a little bit of the kind of mystical qualities that the landscape carries. Um, also, there's almost always the presence of a person, if not the actual painting of an individual in the in the landscape. Um, sort of, I don't know, seeking out meaning and uh, and belonging and, and a sense of place. 
So there's going to be a bunch of these. I just happen to like them. And um, they're, they're little retablos similar to many of the medieval uh, traveling altars that people uh, use. And you find also in Mexico still to this day, a lot of people use those. You'll see them in tourist shops too, but uh, hopefully these elevate above that. So they're small. They're maybe about nine inches to 12 inches tall. Uh, they can sit on a countertop or a table and they can also be hung on the wall and they're, so they close and then they open and inside is a little painting in each of these examples. I went to Norway in uh, 2014 I think for the first time and, and I found these boats over there. They're kind of a double bowed boat that I suppose could have been seen as like whalers used. So there isn't a back end to the boat. Uh, there's just a bow at both ends. And I found them very evocative, many different shapes and uh, qualities, stuff you don't see over here so much. And you'll see in the uh, landscape that Door County has provided me a whole lot of um, information as far as the sky and the water and, and the the landforms too. So like Eagle Harbor is quite present in a lot of my work, even though I don't like to necessarily refer to it as that it's been a, a big influence. You'll find um, that those islands and, and big sky and big water in a lot of my pieces. And then also sometimes more intimate um, back bays and things like that too. This uh, painting is at, uh, um, now I'm suddenly just forgot. Right on Door County? Yeah, right on Door County. This, they bought this piece. It's above their It's really nice. I don't know if you've been on their website, but they have a whole like um, drone video and they show the interior of their new space, which is gorgeous. And yeah. you're, you're, you've got like a really nice shot of your work. I was like, oh, wow, well, nice. I know that guy. <laughs> I did visit there after the uh, before we came home last week. I did. Stop oh, okay, good. Say hi, and it's a really great situation there. So this has a lot more reference to Canada. It sort of started off as uh, Eagle. It started off as Ephraim, and it ended up as uh, someplace in Ontario. But I was gonna say that, like you know, your work really reminds me of the Adirondacks, and I went, I went and. It, it's making me remember because I used to canoe camp down in the Adirondacks and it, it could be upstate New York, you know. Yeah, it, it could be a lot of places. And I, I'm very happy to have people say, no, I know that place. I've been there and it could be wherever you say it is. Uh, the red boat, I find a lot. Um, and I have a red truck that I don't often, you haven't seen in any of these, but they're kind of a remembrance of the particular boats, the 14 foot aluminum Lund fishing boats that I'd fished in. <laughs> that was a Norwegian landscape sky, but I put it in an American context. And this is the one that was in um, the Hardy. This one's currently up, yeah. yeah. And here's a case where um, this is matted. So, you know, you could see, I should say it's in Photoshop. I've taken out the background elements to highlight. And I always include the frames in my paintings when I show them. I mean, I could crop it down to the painting itself, but I think for me at least, and this is one of those tramp art type frames, it's important for me to have that sculptural aspect included. Okay. This is currently at Edgewood Orchard. Um, and this one I think just sold, but it was at Edgewood Orchard too. And this is on their calendar. It's all it's at Edward Orchard as well. In this case, there's a little corner painting, and many of the times they put these little blocks in the corners, and they'll have a little piece of artwork in them that refers in some way. So there's the light in the middle. Yeah, that's that's kind of um, it's meant to be an ambiguous source of uh, either a campfire with smoke or a ghost. And the drowning canoe. Yeah, and then the drowning canoe. There's oftentimes a sunken boat in my paintings uh, because of something I actually I've seen a few times. You know, you'll go up to a lake and there might be an old boathouse where the transom fell off the boat and it sunk. Or I've been out on the water and there was like this 
island that was sitting there and had two boats tied to a tree and both of them were sunk. And it was, they had obviously been abandoned there for years, but they still maintained their, their rope to the tree, but the, both boats were at the bottom or at least sticking up like that. So it's, it's just kind of a metaphorical thing. Um, and this painting was uh, initially going to be in, in a show at April Contemporary that had to do with uh, Corvid's, uh, the crow family ravens. So this one is still there. And I've always, you know, been attracted or sort of intrigued by those birds uh, because of their intelligence and they're kind of, they're watching you oftentimes. And this is called On the Path. And uh, you know, there's kind of a communication taking place. And I, I, I think it was also nice to be asked to be a part of a show that I, I reached out. It's not hugely out of my comfort zone, but something that I felt like I didn't oftentimes paint those kind of things. Here's a few more door pieces. These are um, right now at Able Contemporary. And that fire, if not this fire, the type of fire was the first time I went to, one of the first times I went to Door County with my family, we went to, and saw the Fear Ball Festival at, uh, in Ephraim um, and watched the, the Viking pontoon boat come across and all the fires lit up around the bay. And that was a big influence I still to this day see in my work. So we just left paintings um, and uh, in 2007, I got a printing press finally, about the same time I built the studio. In fact, I guess it was a little before then, but at that point uh, I was invited to show at a, a Peninsula School of Art in a show called Black and White. And so a couple of these paint or prints might be uh, some derived from that show, but I wanted to start to use some of the graphic um, quality. And in fact, here's those two boats that were sunken partially um, that the medium uh, print can provide that I'd have a hard time doing in painting. And I'll show you some prints and why sometimes I think finding uh, the mechanical means and technical means of, of printmaking can allow images to be pushed beyond a place that I might have if I had just been able to paint them. Um, so I was trying to use space in a different way, use a little bit more graphic sensibility. So this is a, a painting about my son. He was he helped me build it. So he's he's standing with this hammer and, and tool belt on one of the uh, um, tops of, of the wall joy or wall uh, studs on uh, the joists that would hold the trusses that held the roof up. So he's up there balancing. And then this is a picture of my dad when he was a teenager up in Minnesota holding very unclear to see in this way two fish. They're both named Karsten. And this is one of my daughter and kind of a, a polka dot dress she used to wear. So dots kind of come into a lot of my paintings and uh, mm, the body of work that I guess I would say just to bring up the division. So all those paintings you saw are pretty much what I've done for 35 years or more um, to one degree or another, the representational traditional work. And then having this influence of printmaking come in and not ha having much of an obligation to think about it as commercial. I started to experiment a little bit more and, and just tried stuff and think thought back about, you know, what would happen if I experimented. I felt like a kid again in a lot of ways. And so there, there are two bodies of work simultaneously existing and somewhat just separate from one another, but occasionally maybe crossing over. And in the future, who knows exactly where all this will go. So this was the fourth of a state print. And a state print is a print where you, you print it once and alter the matrix that is the stone, or if you're an etcher, the plate, and then you print it again and you alter it as many times as you wish. This is the fourth of uh, a couple of three, I guess this is the third of four iterations. So um, here's one of those Norwegian boats again. And then uh, these little graphics of the hands are a person tying a monkey's fist, which is a, a nautical knot that you would tie a rock into a, a, a rope and then you'd use that rope to throw to the shore somebody to catch and pull the boat in. Um, so that's something I just felt like I was interested in in that as a graphic motif and as a symbol. 
So is the boat's kind of sinking possibly or floating. Maybe that's air bubbles and it's going to the bottom or maybe it's uh, glowing and there's like a, an entity above it. So in that visit to Norway, I saw some Viking runes, um, these upright stones like cairns that you'd see um, in other, you know, very early, I guess, Neolithic cultures, maybe after that, oops. Um, so it was kind of a dream of, of that. So that's, this is a lithograph. All the prints I'll show you are lithographs or collages of lithographs. And then we made a, a trip as a family, my uh, wife and daughter and son down to Mexico. And so I had this uh, picture I snapped of the kids running into the ocean for the first time. And I've used that in a lot of, of prints. Now, these I'm just going to rip through because you'll see the reason one of the reasons why printmaking is good to develop ideas is that you have a you have an, a static image that you could print multiples of and be identical or you could use different colors and different combinations of process to take that same image and transform it into many different iterations that it would be like starting a painting from scratch but you have this matrix that you could just use and build on. So some of these are collaged, some of them are painted on, some of them are mono printed, which is a technique where you just actually print uh, and paint on printing ink on, on a flat surface. It could be the, the plate or the stone, which I'd used, or it could be a piece of plexiglass and you just run it through the press and it offsets the ink onto the paper. So I thought, it, how could I maybe make some of these things in a painterly form. So these are paintings on paper of that same subject matter and trying to bring a little of that printmakerly quality into paint. So these went to a show I had in Norway a couple of years after that first visit and are still there sitting in a gallery. Um, I did that, I guess, about five years ago now. And this is a painting um, more recent. It's probably two years old now that I tried to use some of the graphic motifs in integrating that into the landscape form. So it's kind of like a little bit of a hallucination or a dream um, presented in a traditional way. So I, I'll just say that I threw it out there and I tried it and I'm not sure exactly where that's gonna take me, but I was um, something that I'll, I'll investigate further as the whim you know comes up so i i don't think this is the kind of work that's going to replace the work that i first started showing you but it's something that i thought about um, and i will continue to entertain so here's a full color lithograph and anytime you make a print of any sort pretty much every color is layered upon another color you design the print sort of deconstructed from what you want the end result to be in your mind. And then every run through the press is a separate color. And then as they combine on the top of the paper over and over, um, they optically blend colors and then fit together like a puzzle until you get the result you're after or not. <laughs> but anyway, that's, now here's another example of um, using a state print. So it's a single, design there's the, the bodies in the back and then i have this ring like a golden kind of like a um, in a, a chain that sort of um is, is binding together like like a ring would and several different ways of using the same thing in different color arrangements with different elements and then you could start to delete or add elements so that the very final print i basically took out the characters accepting a couple of hands and then that ring. So again, you could use the process to advance ideas. So here's a very small print. Um, and where all these little scritchy scratch marks and these designs came from is uh, if you've ever used carbon paper, you know, to transfer an, uh, an image to a piece of paper or type with, you know that after you pull the carbon paper away, there's a ghost of that um, thing you traced or typed or drew. So I used that um, carbon paper concept where I was transferring some lines to a, a litho stone or a plate by tracing over a drawing and using a 
piece of carbon paper. And then what I did was took a picture of the carbon paper and inverted the image. So I used that that particular kind of line quality that that the carbon paper created. And you could see there's a face in the background. I used that same face here, the same concept with some colorful dots. This was for a, a tandem press um, invited to, to print for their wine auction. And then I use the this next series I'll go through pretty quickly, but these are all uh, generated from plates that I'd saved for prior prints and recombined in ways that I just experimented. I like inked it up in a color and I print it, ran it through the press and said, I wonder what this is gonna look like. And so each one of these press or prints is using a, a plate from a different other print, but in their new combination of results, I came to learn things and I discovered things and it was just kind of an adventure. So there's a whole series of these works they were in the show that I had able. Um, so to reinvent, I guess, and recombine um, some of the elements of prior prints was exciting to me. So they're very graphic. They're very, um, I guess, much leaning more toward the kind of skills set that I used as a graphic designer and an illustrator. So trying to tie that. So I've, I've always had this separate life that I made money doing graphic design and I was lucky enough to make some money doing artwork too. I sell, do sell paintings, but, but the paintings were more for me, you know? And so this was a way to kind of bring some of the points of both of those things together. Um, and I felt real good about the result. Was this like stuff you probably would have been working on in graduate school or did you just completely change your style as you left it? I would say this maybe leans back to something I would have been more likely to do in grad school. It, it isn't exactly like what I did, but but I think um, being around teaching again, uh, being around students, kind of getting um, a little fired up about some more contemporary issues, you know, because you if you're painting um, in your studio and you show in galleries, uh, it takes a lot of energy to get out in, out of that circle. And I don't live in New York. And even if I did, you know, you wouldn't be going to the museum or, or different galleries every day. You start to kind of get into this interior space. So getting outside amongst other artists made, made me think a little bit more about things that I might have engaged with. Like I said at the very beginning, I, I kind of ended up in a place I didn't expect to. And the work was a natural fit for me that I became known for, but it wasn't what I set out to accomplish. So these were kind of touching, oops, touching base with maybe a part of myself that I, I feel like I left behind a bit. Here's a couple of other mono printed um, images. So all you do is you run it through the press and then all these little circles were cut out of newspaper and you just toss them down and then whatever you tossed down and you printed a color, the prior color would still show through and hide that last run. So there was a, a yellow run and there was a red run and then there was a, a run kind of a brown. So where you see a solid, you might use that uh, piece of paper and ink it up and actually place it down on the face of the print so you can get a solid color. Tip. You could sandwich paper together. This is like two layers of paper. So there was a, a translucent rice paper on top of another paper. So much physicality. This is an, another case of the mono printing, not mono printing, but well, each of these is a unique print. So when you hear the word, some people say monotype, some people say monoprint. These are monoprints because the matrix or the, the stone plate or uh, whatever contains the imagery is, is a static pre-established thing. A monotype is like if you had a blank piece of plexiglass and you just painted on it, you're creating the image right then and there from scratch. That's a monotype. So monoprint are these in that they're repeating elements and then varying what's surrounding those elements. So there was about 20 of these 
and each of them is different. And again, it's sort of like, whoa, what's going to happen if I put this down? I have some idea, but I don't have a complete idea of the results. So it's exciting. This is just a four color print. And I started to get, I'm, I'm currently interested in, I'll probably make some other prints that'll look a little like this, of these kind of atmospheric phenomenons. Maybe somebody, you've seen sort of a time lapse photo of a guy with a flashlight at night or something like that. But some some things that combine some of the separate spaces and times with some landscape elements. Um, this was created by fingerprints, just like taking my uh, finger and pushing. It's a print, but the uh, if you looked closely at the face, and you could see it in the trees down below, they're either thumbs or fingers that are creating the mark. This is the last print I did uh, just recently. It's a four color print and I had a picture of this. It, it doesn't matter and actually kind of probably wrecks it to tell you this, but there was a missile that misfired from a submarine and it made this this kind of Fibonacci um, that that spiral in the in the air and I took the, the missile away. <laughs> But I just found it an intriguing form. And then I, I think of when you're casting a line, you know, toward some something hoping to catch a fish or whatever, you're out at night and you have this this kind of a furling of the line too. And so there was kind of this mysticism and um, mystery about you know what this guy's doing in, in the boat late at night and, and these kind of light points of that white or the the uh, rod and then this this uh, spiral in the air so that's pretty much it i don't know if uh, i'll entertain any questions that people have if they care to ask if they're interested enough or um, you could ask me sarah if there's anything that's confusing or you want to yeah i always you know i start, i took printmaking i love printmaking and i but i never took lithography how do you do that yeah, litho's the one, it's sort of like the rare air of printmaking and people are frightened by it or there's very few places that offer it. So the, the concept of lithography is that oil and water resist one another. So let's say in the original, um, Alois Senefelder is a guy who lived in Bavaria and he was a, a music publisher. And in 1798, he, the story goes, was writing with a laundry crayon on a on a making notes on a limestone tablet in the garden and then he somehow for some reason pushed paper against it or maybe sat on it for all I know or leaned on it. and then when he pulled it up he noticed that the image was offset under the paper so this is a, a direct printing process just like with etching you have to draw everything in reverse so it's backwards if you write something you have to write it backwards because it's going to print on the paper and then be lifted off and be in the correct orientation. So the concept goes, um, if you have a greasy material and you have this limestone that's like a, it looks like a gravestone, a uh, perfectly uh, pure surface that loves both uh, grease and water, uh, you draw with the greasy substance and then you take um, gum arabic and some chemistry and you wipe over the top of the, the drawing once you're finished and it won't displace any of the marks. But what it does is chemically change and create a stencil, so to speak, between that non-image area and what you drew. So then you wipe it down like you would wipe a table really tightly. You get that film of gum arabic so that the uh, it's, it's exquisitely flat and smooth. And then you wash away the drawing material with the solvent and then you basically you have an inky roller full of oil-based ink and then you have a wet sponge and some water and you take the wet sponge and you wipe it over the surface of that stone that had the image on it and then as long as you keep it wet moderately wet and then you roll it the ink sticks to the image you drew and then pretty soon it looks exactly like what you drew and you could print it in any color you put it on a printing press like I showed you and it's sort of like um, it's a whole lot of paper or pressure rather placed on a very small like quarter inch band of wood with a leather strip and you put a piece of plastic down and some grease on it and then you crank it through the press under pressure and that pressure just takes and 
pushes the ink into the paper and you pull off after you run it back out you pull it off and you'll have that impression of that drawn material that you've the image you created right on that piece of paper um, so unlike uh, and it's called planographic because there's no actual relief like in an etching you have a relief uh, in a surface that either in intaglio you wipe ink into and then wipe the surface off so it only sticks into the low low points and then you run it through the press or in relief printing like um, wood cuts lino cuts and uh, printing that you'd find in letterpress you're rolling a roller on the top of the high points only the top is catching ink um, and the low points don't so this is like absolutely flat the only thing that creates the image is that water barrier between the, the place that the ink wants to receive and the water is keeping the ink from touching the stone and receiving. So if you let the limestone dry or the you can also use uh, aluminum plates in the commercial world, they use aluminum plates, you roll it, it's going to just go totally inked. So you have to have that water oil kind of balance down. So that's the gist of it. But then what's the sanding part for? Uh, sanding, well, you know, if you made an image, you've got this stone and, and that giant litho stone that I showed you way back here. It's pretty fun. Uh, okay, so on the right here, this little, this little stone by the sink is in what's called a graining sink. And um, that limestone slab is probably this one could could be 50 80 years old who knows they don't make these things too readily anymore there's only one place in the world you can get them in bavaria um, solenheim bavaria and they basically quarry them out of this particular there's two quarries over there there was one in iowa but the technology changed and it was around iowa city and they were good quality limestone there but it's no longer you know, an active commercial thing. So it doesn't exist except to have people uh, create gravel for roads. But you, you could take, um, I don't have a picture of it here, I don't think. Yeah, it's called a levigator, or you could take another small stone and some carborundum grit, which is like sandpaper without the paper. And you put water down and sprinkle this grit, and then you rub over the stone to basically erase the uh, image that you drew and it'll be a paper or two thickness and then you have a brand new surface you can draw on and every time you do that you're reducing the thickness of the stone by you know millimeters if that over time the stones get too thin to print but um, they're they're terribly expensive like this this stone i got from an artist who passed away i got that stone for a thousand dollars which was a bargain wow. uh, in a commercial if you bought this outright commercially from a shop, it, it would be three times that much money. Uh, a press like this um, is, it's called a Fuchs and Lang press. There was a proofing press in commercial printing houses at the turn of the century up until about the 1920s. Commercially, uh, they stopped using these stones. Um, you'll still see in antique stores, you could find like uh, bank notes and illustrations and stuff. I'm sure some of you have run across them, little stones that have imagery on them already. And, and people buy them as decorative things. Here, I, well, I actually have one back there, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just let your imagination go. Um, and they started to just not be used. So these printing houses in the 50s, 60s, and 70s started to have all these stones lying around and they used them in ships ballast they use them to put garden paths they threw them in ditches they threw them off there's probably some in green bay someplace at the bottom of the bay because uh, they were of no value and then till artists in the united states at least then there's always been a continuance of printmaking in europe to a greater degree than here um, they started in a few printing shops one in new york and, and a couple in la uh, become associated with uh, artists working with printers again and starting to find it as a fine art. And the WPA also, there was a lot of printmaking that um, you'll find like Grant Woods and, and uh, Thomas Hart Benton and many other 
artists create these beautiful little black and white lithographs you'll see here and there. But these commercial shops, uh, Gemini Editions, uh, uh, Universal Editions Unlimited, uh, Tamarin Institute started to create um, co collaborative spaces. And, and here in Madison, we have Tandem Press, which is a collaborative space where they invite artists in and they have professional fine art printers that do hand printing, uh, either lithographically, um, relief prints, silk screen, etchings, to work alongside the artist to create their, their work. Um, so I don't know, I kind of think I lost track of what I was driving at there, but um, these are not easy to find and not, not cheap to get. A, a printing press, if you were to buy one, brand spanking new, like a new car off the lot, something this size is from the Tokich company or Conrad Press in the neighborhood of $8,000 or so. You could find used presses, you know, in this size for less, um, but they're just, they're sw kind of swept up by people that know what they're looking for and they're not easy to find. And sometimes you have to drive across the country to get them. <laughs> A, a big full-size press could be fourteen thousand um, dollars, brand new, because they're kind of one-offs. They're built custom, and there's only like two places in the United States that states that build these things. So, it's oh. it's prohibitive. That was really getting back to the original point of why I made paintings. Right. Was, I, made awesome. paintings. <laughs> That's I how you became a painter. Yeah, you you get out of school and you go, oh my God, all these uh, facilities I was so uh, lucky to use, I don't have access to anymore. And there are some community print shops. You know, you pay for your time and you make your prints, but um, there aren't many of them. In bigger cities, you could find a few. But even so, it's it's something that unless you're willing to make um, an effort to build this on your own, it's probably going to be you're going to be doing macrame or you're going to be painting or, you know, doing whatever. But you won't without the printing presses. You could silk screen pretty easily at home in, in a studio that's pretty modest and it's water based, so it's not very toxic and all that. Easy to clean up. But there's there's other things that limit you there too. Um, so I guess it took me a long time to get to the place that I did. And having been invited over the years to to teach, always built the fire up, and then a period of time would pass. But when I saw the opportunity, I took it, and um, I'm glad I did. I'm, I, I feel a little bit like a, a bit of an octopus sometimes. I've got so many fingers and different things that some, I admire a lot of times the artists that are just have a mono focus and they do things uh, to the degree that they're just, you can't touch them. They're just, it, they're doing one thing, but they're doing it so exquisitely. I, I think maybe I was a little ADD or something, and I just had to have a lot of different things going at points. Uh, but, you know, maybe in the end, you get to a, a place that it won't be the same place as focusing on one thing solely, but it's, it's a life journey, you know, and it's a marathon, not a sprint. So I don't, I, I've never depended on selling my work entirely. Uh, it's always been a, a great thing that every year I, I'll make some amount of money and it was a couple of years when I was really selling well that I thought maybe I can quit my day job, but that's its own set of problems. And you know, you you could talk to an artist like Craig Bleets, and he'll tell you what those problems are. Um, there aren't that many artists that actually do work entirely support themselves from the work, even in New York. And and we see these one tenth of one percent artists that that are very successful and quite wealthy, but if that's the reason you're going into art, you're making, you should just become an investment banker, or, you know, be a financial analyst or something, because it's not about the money, that's for sure. Uh, it's got to be a drive or an internal thing for you to do. And it's, and it's very, you got to be willing to hear a lot of no's and sorry's and, you know, you get that letter back. And believe me, I mean, I, this year, I entered a lot of shows that I hadn't done for many years. And I got a, I got as many letter back letters back saying it was a really strong field and sorry you didn't get in. You just got to get used to that. I mean, it's just part of the deal. And and you understand it's one person's opinion, 
or maybe a couple, but it's not the definitive opinion. There isn't a single thing. It's subjective and it's not like adding up numbers. So you can't let yourself get too bruised up about it. No, you need to have um, a very healthy ego and yep. thick skin. Um, yep. I also wanted to mention, you know, uh, printmaking in the professional or in the commercial world isn't sought at as as valuable too you know even though one of the biggest artists in the world andy warhol yeah was a printmaker but his work in the museum world in the institutions is labeled as painting because he used paint to yeah. screen print on his work and so it kind of diminishes the value of print yeah it's a it, for he, he's kind of a weird hybrid because i mean he screen printed on these canvases so with paint and so are they they're mechanically produced paintings or are they prints or we we don't know robert rauschenberg same thing he used a lot of a lot of uh, those same techniques to create his his museum quality and, and scaled work uh, i think the big distinction for and there there is a a circuit or a um an orbit of the art world that printmakers can exist in but it's it, it is considered a secondary art by painters particularly <laughs> But the people that do um, make prints like at Tandem and uh, some of these other places I talked about are painters that make prints. That's slightly different than being a printmaker, if that makes any sense, because they have uh, some cachet due to their success as painters that translates into sales for prints. But to be a, a guy who or a person who strictly makes prints and not paintings it's a very limited subset of the art world and you'll find um, people are always confused about what a print is. Um, you see Terry Redland prints or Thomas Kincaid prints or any print of an artist that you can name, you may not know by, by personage, but here's a, here's a, a, a poster sized painting that you, I mean print that has a number at the bottom. And if, you've, if you're familiar with the way the numbering works, there's a, a number and a slash and another number, sort of like a, a fraction, it looks like. The top number is the particular print that, that you're, the print you're looking at. The bottom number is how many prints there are. That's called the addition. So if you're printing something and you're taking a picture of an existing artwork, that be a painting or some other piece of artwork that is existing in the world, and then you make a reproduction of that and then you print that, that's not a print. I mean, that is that is a reproduction of a painting, but it's not a fine art print. Just because the person signed it, that's that's kind of like, and I'm not being snooty or anything. I mean, if you if you sell work and you have to make a living, you know, that's one way to do it. But as a printmaker, printmaking starts out with an idea and then you create that thing that is the print itself. And it's not a reproduction of something pre-existing in the world. So it's a lot more labor intensive, no matter which way you go. Silk screen, etching, lithograph, uh, relief print, that could be you know, your wood cuts and your lino cuts. Or if you have letterpress capabilities like, like uh, design work for a book or something like that, it's all done by hand. And that's, I think that's what some part of the painting world doesn't like because it's attached to a craft of sorts. Um, I think that's disrespectful <laughs> myself because I mean, I could find um, a lot of superior artists that happen to be printmakers to a lot of the painters that I see. So it's never like this or that. It's like, you just have to look at everything as that particular instance that evidence of that particular artist's body of work and just judge it upon that, not the medium for me. Great. Well, um, I don't really have any questions. I had one question from somebody who asked why we were talking about photo for the submissions. Was in this juried in person? I think we just were covering in case you were going to submit to a different show other than ours, yeah. why you would be focused on photo. I think, uh, it was, yeah, a bit of professional guidance because um, not every show, very few shows you submit in person. Most of the time, if you're interested in doing submissions to juried shows, it's going to be by a photo. 
it's yeah. going to be online submission these days. You don't send a slide or anything, but you're still going to have to take that picture. Right. So, and you should also take a picture for your own archiving. Um, if you are selling work or giving work away to people or whatever, or just maybe you want to participate in social media, you should take pictures. Um, that's, that's why. Oh, well, great. Um, everyone I, has said beautiful work, enjoy learning process. So that's great. I guess one last question and let's just wrap this guy up because I don't know, maybe you said this already, but I don't know. Okay. Where, where's your ideas coming from? I mean, oh. you're like dark, you got this canoe that's drowning. Is this, you got the figure, um, you know, it's camp, it's camping or it's nature, but it's, yeah. I don't know. It's like also surreal. Cause I get like a real Robert Park Harrison vibe from your work and Gregory Crutzen, who are two photographers okay. that do really dark, surreal yeah. imagery. I'm just curious. I'm not, I don't know, maybe you covered this already, but I, I actually didn't, you know, this is one of those things where if you do it long enough, you don't talk about it all the times. So it's sort of like, it's, it's not something that I, um, I verbalize a lot about anymore, but it probably has fragments of my childhood, um, being, you know, a little terrified of some of these places and yet going up there and enjoying my time with my family, but, you know, lakes are scary and the woods are scary and they're beautiful at the same time. And, and you're also in an environment that's foreign, uh, at least from my uh, everyday life, you know, someplace that you look at. Uh, and so there's these kind of mixes of romance and, and nostalgia with, um, I don't know, there's just, there's things about it. I guess you never grow up. Uh, some people say, you know, you're, whatever is ingrained in your personage when you're young, it's sometimes just exhibits itself in different ways as you get older. And I mean, I'm not like afraid to swim in the lake anymore. Uh, I'm not uh, afraid to walk around in the dark or anything like that. But some of that just, there's this little seed in the back of your head that still has, it holds on to some of that. And there's also, when you find these personages, my dad died when I was uh, in my twenties and you know, some of that is loss, I guess, of, and, and there's always a, a person that's out of reach and in the distance and uh, like with fires as a place to gather around or they're, they're warming and some sometimes destructive and other times uh, life giving. Um, so those kind of things, uh, little elements like there's a bait bucket here, just things that I remember seeing when I was younger. And I don't always entertain these themes as much as I once did. But you know, every once in a while, I'll get something like this Norwegian boat that kind of kindled an idea. Um, and I think of the sublime, like I, I look at uh, some paintings from the Hudson River School, um, Thomas Cole, uh, Casper David Friedrich, the, the American West. And and I mean, I pull in from a lot of different places. There's a, a sense of uh, romance and that kind of open possibilities and in nature. Uh, then there's, I don't know, I have a Northern European soul, I guess, in some ways there's something kind of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a glass half full type of person generally, but there's some part of me that just has some of these kind of longing and loss feelings. The boats oftentimes are drifting unmoored or you're alone in a big space. There's a little campfire over here. So I don't know, you know, it's that's that's what propels the traditional work. Uh, when I start to move into some of these paintings um, that start to and prints, it's, it's oftentimes trying to find a balance between some of those ideas or trying to rid myself of some of those ideas that, you know, get my mind out of a groove because it's, it seems like you know, it's easy to constantly, you know, go back to what you're used to and challenge you yourself and try to do things that might have more formally uh, interesting working with pure color or uh, the idea of, in, you know, intentionally leaving some information out, um, trying to work with design a little bit, shape, using process, like I mentioned before, to kind of create
create something you hadn't set out exactly to do and you're discovering along the way. So I hope that covers the bases. Yeah, that's great. Like well, um, I don't have any other questions and um, but yeah, but thank you so much for this presentation and for coming up and sharing our show. It's great to have you and meet you and get to learn about you. And, um, you know, I had a um, it was a nice time to work with you on, on this show, you know, even though it's not in person yet to do the yeah. feedback part of it, you know, but um, I think, you know, you picked a lot of good pieces in the show for awards. Um, like you said, there's a lot of good work in the show that is the same level and, you know, to go through and have to pick this, pick out seven different awards is challenging. So I, I thank you for your your work and your um in, in this talk it's been fantastic thanks so much i thank All right. everybody for coming looks like we most of them a few of them dropped away but <laughs> some of them dropped out um yeah. others stuck around but we had a few 